Good morning. Uh, this last year in youth group, we had an awesome opportunity to meet together each week, and throughout the year, we uh, had a point system going on where students could earn points for doing a lot of different activities, like coming to youth group, bringing their Bibles, uh, memorizing verses, doing service projects, and all sorts of other activities along the way. And um, as the year progressed, students could earn gift cards for every 20,000 points that they earned. And these gift cards go, went toward things like Chick-fil-A, Wendy's, you know, all the stuff that uh, teenagers love to spend their money on anyway. So we thought, why not give them an opportunity to earn points and, and get gift cards for that. And then our plan as we wrapped up the school year was to honor these students who hit benchmark levels throughout the year at our youth service. Well, because of the coronavirus, we were not able to have a youth service this year. And so, uh, but we still decided that we wanted to honor these students for their hard work this morning. Also, along with the point system, uh, if they earn a certain amount of points, they would also earn a discount toward their end of the year activities. The junior high, we were gonna go to a place called Fun For All, and the senior high, we were going to go to Cedar Point. Uh, and again, we were not able to go to either of those places because of the virus. And so uh, if they earn a discount toward their certain activity, we are going to honor them and give them a gift of equal value, 40% off that they would have earned uh, for that activity. So today we're going to honor some students who hit three different levels. Level one is 25,000 to 35,000. Level two is 35,000 to 50,000. And then level three is above 50,000 points. So if you would, please hold your applause and then we'll uh, congratulate these students in each category um, as we go on. So level one, 25,000 to 35,000. Uh, if I call your name, just please stand where you are and stay standing until uh, everyone in your category is recognized. Level one, 25,000 to 35. First off, we have Emily Devinney, Reagan Diedrich, Navi Diedrich, Emily Ahrens, Connor Ahrens, Morgan Murphy, Abigail Ford, Ashley Durig, and Zach Bush. Let's congratulate these students. <laughs> you guys can take a seat. And our second group is level two, students earning 35 to 40, or 35 to 50,000 points. The following students earn this. Uh, Zach Diedrich, Mina Kamikala, Sydney Click, Matthew Stranisha, Rebecca Drylack, Kayla Bush, and Eli Diedrich. Let's give them a hand. In our last category, 50,000 plus, we have two students with this category, one for the junior high and one for the senior high. First off is Logan Webb, and secondly is Rachel Strinisha. Uh, again, we wanted to honor these students, but there's one more group of people that I think uh, should be recognized, and that is our helpers for the youth group year. Uh, this could not happen without all the volunteers and helpers that we have in youth group each week. So uh, the following people helped us throughout the year, especially with games and snacks and other things. Uh, Danny Caldwell and Rachel Click helped tremendously with the snacks and made sure that our students were always fed. And so uh, let's be honest, they're the real MVPs in the eyes of the students uh, to make sure that they got food each week. Um, as well, Katie Ulam helped out with uh, just keeping control of the junior high students. That is a very difficult task to do, so we think her so much for that. Christian Winters helped out a lot with activities and games uh, for the groups, and we thank her for that. And then last but not least, Amanda, uh, helping out so much being there and, and just encouraging me and being there to help uh, serve with the teams as well. So let's give our helpers a hand.
studying the Bible, invite visitors, go to Christian service. All that stuff is just things that we're all supposed to be doing. They just happen to get gift cards for it. So I'm going to have to talk to the youth pastor about where's my gift card. So, hey, we're glad you're here. Uh, this little card in your pew is just for you to fill out real quick and dump it in that offering plate as you go on out. We appreciate that. It just tells us that you're here. Thanks for being here and uh, just, uh, you know, abide by the recommendations in that letter. We appreciate that. We're just glad to see you today. <coughs> Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for the, the deep, deep love of God in our life. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you reached down through your Son and demonstrated your love by allowing your Son to be butchered on a cross on Friday. So I thank you for that. I thank you for loving us that much and serving us through Jesus. So help us to tap into the heart of Christ this morning as we study the Word, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Years ago, Billy Graham was driving through a southern town and was stopped by a police officer for speeding. Billy Graham, the officer said, you're going to need to appear in court. So in court, the judge asked Billy Graham, guilty, not guilty. What is it? guilty of speeding. The judge said, let me $10. $10. Can you imagine that? $10. $1 for every mile over the speed limit. So okay. Then suddenly the judge recognized the famous preacher that was sitting before him. This is Billy Graham. So the judge said, you have violated the law. The fine must be paid. I'm going to pay it for you. So he reaches into his pocket and pulls out his wallet, takes out a $10 bill, attaches it to the ticket, and pays Billy Graham's speeding ticket. And then he did the unimaginable. He took Billy Graham out to eat and bought him a steak dinner. <laughs> When's the last time that happened to you? That, said Billy Graham, is how God treats Repentant sinners, abundant, amazing grace. Isn't that true in your life? The amazing grace of God that He shed upon you, that He gives to you. But often I think as sinners, that we sometimes feel like God's given up on us. That God's just like had enough. Oh, it's you again, coming to me for, uh, didn't we already work through this? Didn't you just come to me like an hour ago about the same thing? And sometimes I think we, we feel like God treats us like we treat other people. Like, there's a limit to the amount of grace that I have to give out to you. And you've exceeded that limit. And sometimes we feel like maybe... We just give up on ourselves, like God is done with me, I've sinned too much, I've done too many horrible things, there's no way that I'm even going to go to God in prayer with this, I'm sick of myself. Great grace. Today, as we begin a new series on finding comfort in Christ, we're going to talk about sinners and sin. I believe that we're all sinners, saints, and sufferers, according to the Bible. So today we're going to talk about the category of being a sinner. So I'd like you to turn with me to Luke chapter 7, because there's an amazing story we need to, to discover this morning in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 7, we'll be reading 36 to 50. And I want you to Watch what Jesus does. Watch what Jesus says in the text. I believe if there's anyone we can imitate, it's Jesus Christ. So watch carefully how he treats an individual 
in this story as I begin reading chapter 7 of Luke, and we'll start in verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster pot of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet, and anointing them with perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what sort of person this woman is who's touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to pay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my head and my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This morning, I'm going to focus on one big idea in this text, and it's simply this, that we must see sinners with the eyes of Christ. We all have eyes, we all see, but sometimes we don't see people the way Jesus saw people when he walked the earth. And this is a great illustration of how he sees people. Now granted, he was God in the flesh, and so he could read people's minds, he, he had that kind of insight, he was divine, and yet he was human. A lot of times, maybe we focus on the divinity of God, and we downplay the humanity of God. Well, in this sermon series, Comfort from Christ, we're going to be looking, yes, at the fact that he's God, and at the same time, 100% a human being who suffered and, and went through and experienced many of the emotions that you do too. He was happy, he was sad, he was disappointed, he was, he was stabbed in the back, he was uh, down. So he felt the full spectrum of emotions, especially as he went to the cross. That last week of his life, a lot of the emotions that he experienced then. So we're going to go to Christ and look for comfort uh, in this series that every other week I'll be preaching. But today we're focusing on how does God look at me when I sin? Is there any grace there for me as a sinner? So this morning I wanted to just break this story down into different parts as we try to see sinners with the eyes of Christ. I mean, we're looking at people who are in this room with us together. Many of us know Christ as our Savior, and yet we still struggle with the old man. The old man still lives within us and is at war with the new man that we received when we became a Christian. So there's always this battle, this conflict in our heart over doing right or giving in to the flesh. So we need to be able to treat each other with grace. And obviously those who don't know Christ, who are lost in their sin, 
and headed for eternal hell. Yes, absolutely. See then with eyes of Christ. Let's look at the setting. I find this intriguing. The Jew, as we read the text, the setting. Simon, his name, Simon of Pharisee, invites Jesus to dinner. Amazing. I find that amazing that Simon would invite Jesus to dinner. The Pharisees were little shadows that followed Jesus around everywhere he went. They were always in the crowd, they were always watching, and they were always like taking notes. What's he saying now? Let's catch him up. Let's trip him up. Let's, let's maybe ask a question that he can't answer. We'll, we'll do that today. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll find out a loophole somehow. We'll, we'll trap him in his words. We'll find him doing something on the Sabbath that he shouldn't have done. So they're in the shadows. They're not Christ's friends. They're his enemies. Obviously, we see in Matthew 23, he excoriates them. He says, you're a, you're a den of vipers. You're a bunch of snakes. You wash the outside of the cup, but the inside is just full of dirt and filth. It's your heart. So isn't it interesting that Luke introduces the story with these words, and Simon, a Pharisee, invited Jesus to dinner. You know, the way they ate dinner back then, it's not the way we eat dinner today. You all are going to go home probably, sit around a square or around the table with high chairs and backs, and you sit there and pass the, the roast around, and that's how we eat. That's not how they ate. They ate in a triclinium, like a three-sided couch, with the food in the middle of the table, and they would lie down on the couch on their left arm and lean into the person uh, I don't know how you do this in COVID stuff going on back then. Um, you lean into the person onto their chest and eat with your right hand. Your feet would be sticking out over the couch for the slave or the servant who would wash your feet while you eat. Hey, that sounds pretty nice, huh? You know, fine dining back in the first century. So it's a very intimate way to eat a meal. You're leaning into the person, and that person's leaning into the person next to them. So I wonder, what was the seating arrangement that day? Where did Jesus sit? Was he leaning into Simon, the Pharisee, on his chest? Interesting. I don't know. Anyway, he invited him to dinner. He invited someone that he really probably was opposed to to dinner. The question is, why would he do that? Why would Simon invite Jesus to dinner? And I wonder if maybe he just wanted to get a closer look at this Yeshua character, this, this man from Galilee, this preacher that has taken the world by storm. And he wanted to get a closer view of this guy and see what makes him tick and spend some time with him. So that's the setting. It's a meal in Simon's house. It's a nice time. Enter another character. The Bible says in our text, in verse 37, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. So she was a woman. That was who she was. That's the first thing we know about her. And we obviously understand back in that culture, women were not valued as they are today. So that was strike one against this person. Strike two, the Bible says she's a sinner. I find that odd, don't you? Why would Luke include that in the text? Why would he say, and she was a sinner? My Bible says in Romans 1, 2, and 3, we're all sinners. My Bible says in Psalm 51 that we become sinners at the moment of conception when we become a human being in the mother's womb. My Bible says that everyone is a sinner. Why would Luke, the author, feel like he had to put that in the text? Doesn't that make you go, huh? It does me. Theologically, it's like, why would he put that in? And she was a sinner. You know, obviously she had a reputation. 
she was an immoral person. I don't know how she got that reputation. Was she a prostitute? Was she a thief? Um, we don't know. But she had a reputation in town. Like when she would walk down Main Street, oh, she's a sinner. The Pharisees certainly would keep their distance. She's a sinner. Don't touch me. I have to go get ceremonially clean in the mikvah, take a bath, because you touched me, you brushed against me. So this woman was used to being treated like a pariah, like an outcast of society. She was a sinner, she had a reputation for that, and that's what people whispered about her as she walked by. Oh, she's a sinner, stay away from her. Interesting. She was uninvited. <laughs> She crashed the dinner party. Simon would never have invited her. Simon was a Pharisee. Simon was the kind of guy who would stand on the street corner and get all this tassels in it, clothes just right, make sure he looked good to put on a big show because he's about to pray. Oh, Lord. That's a Pharisee because Pharisees were far superior spiritually than anybody else. And they looked down their nose at everybody else, tax collectors and sinners and publicans. You know, we, we're not like that. Stay away from me. Don't touch my robes. Keep your distance. This is the kind of home that she decided to enter into uninvited, on her own. It kind of makes you say, huh, doesn't it? Why? Would she do that? What would ever motivate her to enter into a house, a pit of snakes is waiting for her inside that house? She knows what she's going to get. She's going to get that evil eye look at her. She's going to she's going to be treated like an outcast. Why would she ever taste that bread? It turns out that the answer is hidden away. I think. In a verse we didn't read. So bump back chapter 7. I think this is the answer. Because Jesus had a reputation too. People would <laughs> whisper about Jesus in public too. And what would they say about Jesus? We already know what they said about the woman. Keep your distance. She's a sinner. She's evil. What were they whispering about Jesus? Hey, check it out. Let's go to verse 34. Because here was his public reputation for some people. What's the Bible say in verse 34? The Bible says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, here's what they were whispering, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And that was his reputation with some people. Oh, there goes Jesus. He's, he's that guy that hangs out with all the sinners, the tax collectors, the down and outers, the losers. Now, we don't stay away from him. We don't make time for those people. What's his problem? So I wonder. In fact, I would bet, this is just me, I think that this woman who crashed this party, this sinful woman, maybe heard about Jesus' reputation. Maybe she was in the crowd, maybe at the beginning of chapter 7, and she heard Jesus teach, maybe she saw Jesus do some work, and she heard about his reputation. Oh, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He's a drunkard. And she felt like, maybe this is the one person who could help me. She was uninvited, and she took a huge risk going into this guy's house. But not only that, she was broken. You know, you look at the text, she's filled with emotion the moment she walks in to this house, uninvited as a sinner that's going to be condemned and maybe thrown out of her ear. She comes in and she's weeping, the Bible says. This isn't a little tear that you shed when your sports team loses. Oh, the Pirates lost. Oh, I guess they can't lose this year, right? <laughs> no one's playing. No, this is weeping. Like the faucets are turned on and just 
Tears. Have you ever cried like that before? This woman is. This is, this is not subtle, folks. She's walking in uninvited with a public reputation, entering into the last place you'd ever want to enter in uninvited as a sinful woman. And she is just beside herself emotionally. She cannot turn it off. She's weeping. And what does she do? She comes over to Jesus Christ, to him, nobody else in that dinner table. She comes over to him, and I feel like she's broken by the weight of her sin, but she's also hungry for grace. Finally, maybe somebody that will talk to me, accept me, help me. Somebody. I'm such an outcast. And she was worshipful. Unlike the Pharisee, she knew who Christ was. She didn't need a dinner date with Jesus to figure that out. Simon, seems like you needed that. She knew who she was entering in to see. Why would she ever risk so much to do all of that? I don't think so. It's Jesus she came to see and nobody else. And we know that clearly. Look at what she does. She worships Jesus. She worships him and focuses on washing his feet with her tears, drying him with her hair, and kissing him, anointing him with ointment, special ointment. And Jesus takes all this in, and it prompts him to tell a story. Jesus was always good for a story, wasn't he? At the right time, the perfect story with the perfect application. So he tells a story, he says, you know, uh, Simon and I have something to say. He says, teacher, say it. Okay, here's the story. Two fellows in debt. One fellow owed about a, a month and a half of debt. Small pile of money. And another fellow, he owed almost two years worth of wages. Didn't happen. And neither one of them could pay. They're both in debt. And the master graciously says, you know what? I wiped the books clean. Nobody owes me debt. Not you, but the little, not you, but the great. Oh, happy day. Jesus turns to Simon and says, Now, Simon, who do you figure is going to be more grateful? And Simon knocks this one out of the park. He gets the answer right. I think it's the person who owed the most. The fellow almost owed two years' worth of wages. And Jesus says, Simon, Great job, man, you, you got it right. That's exactly right. Then the Bible says, he turns. He turns and looks at the woman, but he's speaking to Simon. Turning to the woman, but this is for Simon, not so much the woman. And we enter into the salvation. And Jesus asks, Simon, do you see this woman? I find that to be an odd question, don't you? Um, Simon might have been thinking, yeah, I didn't invite her. She's a sinful woman with a horrible reputation. She crashed into my house uninvited, and uh, she never stopped crying. She made a scene of herself. She's crying out of her feet, pulling her hair down and wiping her feet dry. She's pouring this smelly stuff all over your feet so I can hear her, see her, smell her. Yes, I see the woman. Why would Jesus ask that question? Did you notice how the story began, how the text began? Luke includes this word, and behold, come, a woman. Look, a woman entered into the house. Now Jesus is saying, Simon, look, behold, do you see? I mean, do you really see this woman? He's focusing on sight. How are you seeing this woman? We already know how Simon feels about this woman. We already know how Simon thinks about this woman. Because the text tells us, because they were thinking it. If this man were really a prophet, this Jesus guy, 
But if you really a prophet, you would know what kind of woman is now touching his feet. Because she's a sinner. And we know that. And she doesn't belong here. Certainly shouldn't be touching his feet. And will never touch my feet. They felt superior to this woman. They're pharisaical. So Jesus points to her actions. And he says, you know what, when I walked into your room, Simon, you never washed my feet. That was a common courtesy back in the day to wash people's feet. They had sandals on, not Nikes. And so they would get dirty and you just would wash people's feet. Jesus is just making a point. You didn't do that. And she went beyond that. She washed my feet with her tears and dried my feet with the glory of a woman, her hair. What woman, what woman here would wash your husband's feet with water and then dry your husband's feet with your hair? Any takers on that? That's above and beyond, isn't it? It's crazy. I mean, who likes feet anyway? They're nasty, right? You know, they got calluses and corns and fungus and all that. Picture this. She's taking the glory of a woman, her hair, and wiping the dirt and all the water off of Jesus' feet. Jesus said, when I walked in, Simon, you never greeted me with a kiss. It was common in the ancient Near East to, to greet them with a kiss on, on their cheek. This woman went above and beyond that. Instead of kissing his cheek, his face, she kissed his feet, just nonstop kissing his feet. Aren't you wondering something right now? Like, what's wrong with this woman, maybe? <laughs> or maybe there's something else going on here? Why only focus on the feet? She's not done yet. Then she takes out not olive oil, which was very common back in the day, not olive oil contained in a clay jar, which was disposable, cheap. She takes out an alabaster vial. Luke makes sure he includes that in the text. It's alabaster vial. This is, this is special. What's in it? Smelly perfume or ointment. When would you use that? For very special occasions. I mean, you just wouldn't go around, you know, throw it in the air, you know, you know, a little deodorant in the morning. You don't do that with this stuff. You treat this stuff very, very carefully. It's very precious. You only use it for uber, uber special occasions. And here she is. She takes it, comes through all of her teeth feet. And there you go. Anoints his feet. So, why the feet? If Jesus is king, I read in 1 Samuel that kings were anointed with oil on their head, not their feet. Samuel, David, others, head, even here, said head but no feet. Why? Why is this woman so focused on the feet of Jesus? I wonder if Isaiah can help us out. Isaiah 52, 7. I don't know that the woman knew this. I doubt that she would know this verse. I know Jesus knew this verse, obviously. But we know this verse now, don't we? Isaiah 52, 7. And I think there's maybe a theological connect here that maybe even the woman didn't truly understand. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Good news. This woman was so used to being scorned and isolated from and talked about in public. Finally, she thinks maybe, just maybe, she found someone who's going to treat her like a human being and spend some time with her and help her as she is burdened by the weight of her reputation. I, yes, I am truly a sinner. And I need grace. Maybe this Yeshua person can help me today. Maybe he won't throw me out. Maybe he will help me. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. Good news, good news, I give to you. And this woman was hungry for some good news in her life. 
And Jesus, the Bible says at the end, forgave her sins. Lest we misread the text, Luke adds this little snippet that Jesus says, Go away, you're saved. Your faith has saved you, not your works. Many people might read this text, oh yeah, she was saved because, wow, look what she did. I mean, great sacrifice, took a huge risk, you know, public humiliation, probably waiting for her. Uh, she dumped out a super expensive ointment on the guy's feet um, and, and went above and beyond the call of duty, not kissing the cheek, but constantly kissing the feet. And maybe that's why she got saved. No, that's not how you get saved. Nobody gets saved with good works. You may be here this morning and you don't know Christ and you feel like maybe if you just do enough good stuff, it'll outweigh the bad stuff that you've done. But salvation doesn't work that way because Jesus took all the bad stuff called sin and nailed it to the cross that day and paid for it with his blood, 100% paid for it, and now offers us a gift called salvation, full and free. Just receive the gift. I've paid for it, and you owe nothing. You must receive the gift. And that's what this woman did. Her faith was demonstrated. James 2, 17 says that, you know, if faith without works, there's no works to go along with your faith, then your faith is dead. This woman demonstrated she had faith by going above and beyond the call of duty and demonstrated her faith through works. But works did not save her that day. Her faith did. And James would agree with that. You see, as Christians, we need to demonstrate our faith. We need to show that we love Christ with words and deeds. And that's exactly what Jesus did his entire life. In fact, Jesus practiced the ethic all the way up to the cross. Go to the cross. The image of the cross reminds us that Jesus was nailed between two convicts, two fellows that deserve to be there, a rose between two thorns, if you will. And so one was unrepentant, and the other saw Jesus for who he was and saw himself that he deserved to hang on the cross and turns to Christ and ask for mercy, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Two men, two debts, two different eternal destinies. One went to hell that day, and the other one went to paradise with Christ. Based on what? Faith. You know, this morning, I think we need to see people with the eyes of Christ. How does Christ look at people? You know, as we leave this morning, remember, what's so amazing about grace in the first place? We sing that song, we're used to singing that song, but do we really tap into it and make it personal? I don't know how long you've been a Christian, maybe 30, 40, 50 years, I don't know. But sometimes I think we can get used to grace. We get so used to just receiving grace, we feel entitled. Well, of course, God's going to forgive me because that's what God does. So, Lord, here I am again. Please forgive me. And we get kind of nonchalant about it, perhaps, at times. We have to remember that it's an amazing gift that was given. Like a man who was forgiven an enormous debt by the Master. And then like a woman who came in and was enormously grateful and worshipful, so much to the point that she skipped Jesus' head and went straight to the feet. How beautiful are the feet of those who offer grace, the gospel of grace. So consider, how often do you have to go to Christ and say, Lord, it's me again. Yep. And it's for the same thing. Yep. And I'm asking you, please forgive me. I was wrong, and I blew it again. Could you please forgive me? And guess what? God's grace is abundant and available, and I think that's the way we need to give it out, to give out grace in abundance to each other. Yes, to one another as a church, 
to one another because we still continue to sin even as believers, but we need to give the grace out. And sometimes that's a really tough thing to do, isn't it? Really tough. Whether you're a parent or whether uh, you know, you're just working with each other uh, at church or outside of church, it's a difficult thing sometimes to give grace out. But then I always have to go back to the cross. And sometimes if you have a really tough time giving grace, the really the best thing to do is make a beeline to the cross, to that blood-soaked cross, and just remember that my Savior hung there one day and bled out and died and gave up his life for me, willingly gave his life up for me and my wickedness. So how can I not in light of that, extend grace and forgiveness to my fellow brother or sister in Christ. And that's the challenge I give to you. But I encourage you today. Grace to you today. I'm glad you've come. Let's give grace out to each other as we need to each day. Because we are truly in God's debt. Well, thank you for coming this morning. I'm going to ask Steve, he would come and make a quick announcement. Anyone that could help out with a little cleaning afterwards, we'd appreciate that. Uh, hope you have a great week. Thanks for coming. Steve, if you close your prayer, thanks. Good morning. Uh, just a quick announcement on behalf of Mark Poach. On July 12th, following the service, there will be a quick business meeting with a vote on the pastoral search committee. Um, names have been selected by the Unified Board. You'll have the opportunity to look over that list and cast your ballot of who you'd like to see on the pastoral search committee. That's all. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather in your house. We thank you, Lord, for Pastor Jeff, his message to us. We pray, Lord, that you will... Help us to take these words, uh, bless our lives with those words, and help us to live out um, our time here on this earth according to your will. Lord, we just pray that you will bring us peace, comfort, and guidance during this time as we watch a lot of crazy things in the world. Lord, we know that you are in control and that you will bless us and guide us through all that happens. 